Hello, I'm Malcolm Hartsman. And I'm Janice Baker. Can you play the didgeridoo? No, I can't, but I can play Scrabble. Hopeless. We're meeting a didgeridoo player who has an amazing backstory. And we're also meeting an author who's written a book of poems entitled A Rising Moon on Domestic Violence. Next on, on Our Time. I love the sound of a didgeridoo in the morning. <laughs> Similar to something that they said in a movie, but it wasn't a didgeridoo. And I thought that was an original quote. <laughs> Oscar, do you like the sound of a didgeridoo in the morning? Yes, I do. <laughs> I'd say he likes the sound of a didgeridoo any time. Any time. <laughs> it's our great pleasure to welcome to our time Oscar Asvenu. Oscar, thanks for coming in because you have one of the most interesting backstories I think I have ever heard. Thank uh, you. Let's start when you're a little boy and where you came from. Okay, um, my full name is Oscar Asbano. I come from a town called Soe. It's in West Timor. It's in Indonesia. It's just north of Darwin. So Soe is on top of the, the highest peak in Timor, one of the highest peak. So we can, when I, as a kid, I always climb a tree and look over the ocean. Oh, Australia over there behind <laughs> the right? blue. Yeah, yeah. Oh, behind, I it's, it. it's, it's, I, I still remember that memory until yeah. now. That so are you Australian? I'm Australian now. So that, now? Now. But when you were living there, um, you're Timorese? Timorese Indonesian, yes. Okay. Keep going, because it gets even, even more, more interesting. interesting. Yes. So, um, yeah, I grew up as a... Uh, we own big land. I have I grew up with uh, six sisters and four brothers. Wow. No TV. No, <laughs> we, we got TV, but it's black and white. Yeah. And <laughs> electricity only runs like uh, from six when the sun is down, oh, six nice. to midnight. Yes, okay. uh, after midnight, there's, there's no more electricity. And, uh, and I have to go down fetch water like about one kilo, one kilometer down the right. on the valley, and then yeah. and carry it back. Carry it back, and I uh, went to school. I have I had to work uh, six days return. Yeah, and then wow. um, yeah, so um, basically I grew up as a farmer boy. My my parents, we we have money, but cause big family, and they all study in main island in Jaffa. Everybody study. Everybody study. Everybody has degrees, and then. Wow. Yes. And then yes, um, and then I like farming, so yeah, and because farming I always climb the tree and I can see Australia far away <laughs> in the south coast, and then yeah, my dream just come when well, I come well, to Australia. What did you think when you could see Australia far away? Oh, uh, did you feel you wanted to come here, or what did you feel? In Timor, we see Australia as a dreamland. It's it's okay. something amazing because we know it's just it's just across that ocean there, yeah, but. Yeah. Yeah. But it's hard to get to Australia. It's yeah. every every kid in Timor. You ask them. They want to go to Australia. They want to. They want to come. And then, because what was your impression of Australia that you would have a better life there, or uh, or twenty four hour a day power, or uh, no, running this, water, uh, or because uh, when when we grow up, um, we have we the only family has TV has TV in the whole neighborhood. All oh, right. And then at that time. We didn't get Indonesian TV. We most of the time we get ABC. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and in those days it was riveting, I suppose. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so if the electricity come on like normally six o'clock, so like just ten to six, normally it's already on. And before Indonesian TV dominate the whole area, mm. we tried to make around get ABC. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and it's like, oh, that's Australia, that's amazing, that's they the land just, just across there. Uh -huh. and How that's, amazing. And that's make me want to learn English. Ah. So, um, and then uh, we grew up in Timor, because there's war in East Timor, in West Timor. We're not allowed to using our own language. Right. We have to use Indonesian. <clears throat> and then, since then, I look like, why? Why I'm not allowed to use my own language while people from Jaffa come to Timor, they use their language and they even try to talk to us in their language. And I think, like, That's weird. it's wrong. Yeah. Like, you know, mm. and I think uh, rather than I learn Indonesian or Japanese more, uh, I learn English. I want to go to Australia. <laughs> Obviously, yes. So, yeah, so that's, um, and that's, uh, and that's when I become closer to Australia. And 
since then I, I realized, oh, there's lots of uh, backpackers in, in my town from Australia. So, uh, so because I have to walk to school about six k's, and on the way back, I'm going to pass the, all right. the hotel and backpackers where all the Australian tourists, yeah. tourists hang around. So I go there, hang around with them, tell me about Australia, I learn English. So yeah, so basically I, I learned English on the street and then um, I had hard life like, uh, and then every time my trick before, after talk with the, all the tourists in the hotel, yeah. oh, 10 o'clock I have to go home. And then I, <laughs> after good night, I say, ah, oh, good night, then I come back again. Oh, actually, can I have a strawberry Fanta to take home? <laughs> <laughs> they say like, why? I said, I got four, I got four brothers and sisters waiting for me. And they always watch on TV that in Australia, you always drink soft drink. <laughs> so my, my brothers and sisters want to try it as well. So that's my job. I love go, that. go talk to tourists. And bring home and some And bring home Fanta. some soft drink. Fanta for, <laughs> we have, we call Fanta orange there. Yeah. <laughs> How amazing. But your story is just so big. Yeah. So, um, we just have to keep moving here because you speak this whole batch of languages. Yes. So how did all that come apart? So it's, uh, since you kids, uh, when I start learn to read in Indonesian, I also learn to read in English. So basically, uh, my, my brain already start get used to that different section of the language, and it's um, and then um, I went to Bali. I come back, and then my mom bought me a. Uh, book that has English, Japanese, Indonesian. So I grew up, I learned English three different languages when I was year five. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah. And they say though that's the best time to learn because your brain will take yes. in in different parts. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. But then um, it would just cut, to, cut quickly forward because one of the reasons that we had you have you on the show is because you've been busking in yeah. the Adelaide Mall. But hang on, before you got to the mall, You've got university degrees in? In uh, international studies, specialised sports and development. Yep. You speak Japanese, but you married a girl from? Australia, from Adelaide. From Adelaide. Met in Mount Gambier. Met in Mount Gambier, but then you lived, or she lived, you lived with her in Japan? Yeah, we lived in Japan. When she graduated, we went to Japan to live there for three years. Right. But then you came back to Australia. Yes. And you decided, oh, all this knowledge I've got, what will I do? Well, everybody thinks I'm um, South African, so maybe I should learn to play the drums. Yeah. Was that the story? Yeah, so I started playing the drum when I was in Japan. Oh, OK. So uh, basically, it was when I was in Japan, uh, my wife teaching English and I, I love soccer. I grew up with playing soccer. So, oh, it's another story. Yeah, yes. so I, I went trial with a club there and then, because I'm a bit too old, but my skill is good. So they say, oh, how about you come to our school, soccer school, and then teach all the young ones. Ah. Like, so, so, and then normally I travel with what they call the second, second team. So like you have the top one in the National League mm. and you have the one unfit one in the National League you come. So we always play together. Every time after play, going to nightclub, they say, like, hey, Rastaman, play us the drum. <laughs> and I say, like, me? They look at me like, yeah, you, you cool Rasta. I say, like, no, I'm a soccer player. They say, like, no, you need to learn this. This is your culture. And I said, like, why? Because you're black. <laughs> Just no, because. And, like, but, and then they said, like, but, but this is your culture. I said, like, all right. So I start playing. I start playing the drum and then. Because he can, he can do anything. Yes, and, uh, and, obviously. And then, so you're back home and you think, well, maybe I, if yes. they would think I'm Aboriginal now, so maybe so, I should. Uh, <laughs> so that's, that, that's the story coming in. So I, I play the drum. So between my class at Adelaide Uni, I went to the mall. So I went to uni, bring my gear, bus, and then, and then when I graduate, uh, when I start, I make like being a small man, but science and anything you do in life, if you study after four years, if you study every day six hours, after four years you get undergraduate degree. Or if you want to continue postgraduate, you add another six, two mm -hmm. years to six, and the same, same mm -hmm. route. So after a bus, when I graduate, and suddenly I realized, hang on, I think I already graduated from 
playing drums as well. Uh, I mean, <laughs> uh, I, can, I can prove with that because uh, the <laughs> amount of money I make is the same as professionals. Yes. It's, uh, I, I just like. So, and then um, my last degree, it's 2006, part of my international studies, I studied in South America. Study in there, live in Chile for a year, so always travel in Brazil, Peru. And they said, like, oh, so you Australian? I said, like, yes, I'm from <laughs> Australia. And they said, like, ah, you the black Australian, so as your culture. I said, like, me? <laughs> they said, like, yeah, play didgeridoo. I said, like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I, love I, was in, I was in Japan before. You guys say I'm African. Now I'm like, and I have to explain to them. All right, I'm dark skinned, I'm look like indigenous. I'm from Australia, but I was born just top of Australia. They look, they look at the, some of them has pictured like, yeah. most of these guys are Mapuche, Indian, Indian Mapuche. So right. they, they're indigenous as well, so they really want me to be indigenous so they can share, share their culture with me. So like, uh, and I just think like I have to do something about it and then I ignore it. <laughs> so, um, so when did you learn to play the dish? So did, did this come this close to that? So, so one day, just before we leave South America, we went to, we went to cross over to Argentina from Chile. So this town called Frontera. So this is like, this is like right near the bottom, nearly Antarctica, bottom of South America, of the whole American island. Yep. So this Frontera, after that, it's all just snow. So while we came there, Early in the morning, there's two Indians coming, running with a stick. They say, oh, where's, they come to the, this area where everybody came. They say, oh, where's the black Australian? <laughs> <laughs> they say, I'm black Australian. They say, oh, yeah, that's his stand there. They come like, oh, they say, like, send uh, that. They talk in the language, like, come, come out, come out. So I come out, and then um, they give me the deed. They say, like, you, black Australian. I say, like, yeah. Like this. Like this. <laughs> And then, like, they, they really serious with all the Mapuche dress with Indian oh, headgear, really? and I just... So could you? And at the time, I can't play this, this, and then I just look at them like, yeah, I know I'm from Australia, but... We're going to have to have you back and talk more about this, because this is fantastic. We're nearly out of so time, so we need you to yes, play. Yes, play something, please. We need you please. to prove how good you are. So, so this is, and after that, I say, like, I still remember the Indian face, and since then, I say, like, I need to show them this. Okay. <laughs> Welcome back to our time. Elizabeth Blade contacted me through the week and it's great when we hear from people because you never know, there might be a story in it and we might be able to present the person to you with their story and that's exactly what we're going to do right now. Welcome Elizabeth Blade. Thank Hello, you for Elizabeth. having me. No, thank you well, for coming in. Yes, it's lovely. I really was interested in your story because you've written this book. Now, it's not a huge book. It's just a nice little book that's perfect for a coffee table, take on the bus or the tram with you. Yes. Um, but the subject matter is really, really interesting and very much a thing of the time that we're now talking about with domestic violence. Very much. So first of all, have you written before? Yes, I've actually been uh, writing since I was, you know, just a little kid. Really? Um, and it's only when I grew older that I thought... It just can't be laying around in a notebook anymore. It has to be out for people to read. Yeah. So I took the plunge. And but it's not a novel, it's not a mystery or a... It's a poem book, poetry. Book of poetry. It is a book of poetry. Which, which these days we don't seem to use as much as we used to. I mean, I remember studying poetry at school. Do you remember that? Yes. And Shakespeare, and we thought, what on earth is all this about? <laughs> I know now, but I certainly didn't know then. Mm. But um, this is a very common thing. And just wondering if you can find a piece of a poem there that you might like to give us an example of what you've been writing. And as you're doing that, tell us who inspired you to write the pieces. Where did the stories, the background come from? 
Okay, well, the, the background of these stories, the inspiration comes from things that I've seen that people have gone through. I've seen the aftermath of what happens to, uh, to women and it, it is something that I really believe that I wanted to write about and mm. I want to express it. And the way that I express things is through poetry. Mm. And, um, Can we have an example, please? Yes. Uh, this is a, a, a sample from the book and this is a, a poem called It Needs to End. Violence needs to end. We need to be lovers and friends. We should at least be civil towards one another. Deep down, aren't we all sisters and brothers of this land? We should walk together hand in hand. We should all just rejoice. We really do have a choice. Instead, we tear each other down. We get laughed at and kicked to the ground. We need others and they aren't around. Domestic violence is everywhere. In every country, in every place in the world, it needs to end. Nobody should live in fear. Wow. How true. Very powerful. How it's true. Lovely. Uh, to actually, though, come from your background, you hadn't written, you'd been writing, but you hadn't done and compiled something like this. How hard was it to find somebody to print, publish and so on? Oh, it was quite confronting, I mean, especially along the subject line. Um, when putting it together, it was, it was quite a uh, therapeutic uh, and it was very um, daunting all mm, at the same time. Sure. Mm. Um, it was, it's a very raw emotional piece. Uh, like you said, it's not the, the most biggest book. But, um, it doesn't need to be to get the point across. No. And it doesn't need to be to share the experiences either, does it? No, and I definitely like to think that this puts the point across through poetry in a, in a different mm. form. And uh, it, was, it was quite... It's never smooth sailing when writing a book. It's, um, I had to look for um, a publisher and I found one and I was very happy that they, that they picked it up. And... Um, it's, I, I released this book last year and it has just been somewhat of uh, an emotional ride up oh. from last year and, until this point. And it, it's actually going quite well and it, it could go even better. Now, Elizabeth, um, your inspiration for this was obviously, you were saying, work that you were doing as a volunteer. Yes. So this is not experiences that you've had yourself. It is personally seeing it from the other side and help trying to help people. Very much so, yes. I've, I've actually um, had a uh, family member that has gone through um, domestic violence mm -hmm. and um, I've had close friends that has gone through it and um, it is quite an emotional uh, battle, um, one that they never seem to... Um, Recover from. Recover from, exactly. Mm. It, it's always, as the song goes, there's always something there to remind me. Yeah, yeah. frightening yeah. that. Is it always women? No, no. I've uh, come across uh, males also that have uh, been verbally abused and or emotionally abused as well. And uh, I've, I've seen them what they were like before and being emotionally torn down. Mm. Is, and um, they're a shadow of themselves now. So... That to me is, um, that is just really sad that it has come to that. Do you feel, it, is, it, is it two people trying to get one up and ship on each other, do you think, whether it be vocal, verbal or physical? I believe so. It's, um, it's all about power. It's about standing over them and it's about, you know, I'm, it's either like belittling the person mm. and it's about push, putting them down and pushing them down and... It's all about mind control to a, a lot of a lot of people. Mm. It's like who's the boss? I'm the boss, and um, it's just all about power and controlling. Yeah, and usually you find that the people that are doing that are very insecure themselves. So it's a it's a feeling that they need to have to feel more powerful against other people that don't need that at all. Yeah, and sadly it gets inflicted on other people. Mm. And the people I've seen it to, they are very good people. And for, for that to happen to them, it's, it's really sad because yeah. they're not the same after the fact. No. no, do you remember we've had people on the program before talking about 
learning to love yourself because if you can't love yourself how can you love anybody else mm. and how can anybody else love you for that matter so it's really good advice I guess for everybody um, to, to have a look for a book like this and particularly this one because we're talking about it it's called yes. a rising moon on domestic violence by Elizabeth Blade and it's available where Elizabeth it's available on uh, Amazon Australia and it's also available um, Google is, is a good uh, good way to put it. Um, do, you have a, do you have a site for this at all? Um, if people were to go to my Facebook page at okay. facebook.com forward slash Elizabeth Blade Writer. Um, and this is, not a, this is a public page, not your personal page no, they're looking no, for. It's, so it's writer. It needs to have writer after It has writer. Then you can get all the information. Mm. Um, so for the future, do you feel this is the beginning of more? Oh, most definitely. Not necessarily on this subject, but yep. just general subjects. I've actually co-authored uh, over 16 books in America as well. Um, oh, gosh. Well, we didn't know about <laughs> that one. <laughs> just thought no, you had the I one. No, I think I'll throw that in there. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've also uh, co-authored um, quite a few pieces in America. Uh, one actually went to international bestseller. Well done. Fantastic. And um, I've been involved in other domestic violence books also. And two of the books that I was in, all the proceeds uh, went to charity. Well done. Uh, to the domestic violence uh, shelter. Yeah. So. Wow. So do you feel your career will develop further in this way or do you feel you... Do you just write poetry for fun? I just... It's always been... Uh, it's always been something about poetry to me. It's, uh, it's something that I, I've loved to do ever since I was little. Um, I remember when I was very little and I'd be, you know, saying the words out loud and scribbling in children hieroglyphics, as they do, mm. and my mum would overhear and she'd write it down. Did she? And oh, okay. she says, you know, when, you know, <laughs> these are poems you're doing. <laughs> Isn't that brilliant, though, that she had the presence of mind to, to do, do that? To actually do that. Uh, do you hear the music in the words? Is that what you hear as you say the words or write the words? Music. great program. You know, sometimes we have people on the program, we have no idea what's going to happen. No. <laughs> and that happens. And this is one of those. Yes, Elizabeth, it's been lovely talking to you and we wish you luck with the book. Yeah. And Thank you both so much. Honestly, um, we were... Th that's the little book. That's th but she has more. She has lots yes. more. Yes. I have more at my sleeve. Yes, you'll be another person to talk to in a year's time yes. or so. And Oscar, we just love your stories <laughs> and your playing. We were just talking there while we were setting up about the English tourists in the Rundle Mall. Just quickly tell us the story. I love it. So they, the mostly British tourists. They come like, oh, you make our day special. I said like, why? <laughs> uh, we've been here two weeks. We're looking for indigenous Australian that's play didgeridoo on the street, <laughs> and then this is our last day. And then when we come, oh, we find you here. Oh, you make our day special. I said like. Yes. <laughs> you finished taking your photo? Can you go? <laughs> <laughs> love it, love it, love it. If they only knew what lurked beneath that fuzzy hair of yours, I love it. Yes. So, so, uh, often our uh, brothers and sisters come and ask, oh, have you claimed your indigenous money with your didgeridoo to Centrelink? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we've got to go in a tick. Could you play us out for the program because it's been yeah. just great having you here. And, I will invite you right now to come back in the future. Please do. As with you too, Elizabeth. Thank you. And yeah. Thank you. Great. Good luck with all of that. Yeah. Thank you so, so much. So until we see you next time, here is the haunting sound of Oscar playing the didgeridoo.